On this episode of Doing the Most, we're going to help you make your very first beer. There's a lot of homebrewing content out on YouTube these days, and a lot of it presumes that you're going to start by diving in and buying a bunch of gear. Carboys and airlocks and buckets and Campton tablets and all the stuff that you see in these videos. And if you've never brewed before, I can tell that that would kind of be intimidating. We've tried to take everything we've seen on the platform and narrow the scope, kind of remove everything that isn't absolutely necessary to brewing and use the doing the most perspective to brew very, very beginner friendly recipes. So we're going to be doing this very differently than I normally brew. I hope if you're a very, very beginner brewer that you find this content helpful. We're going to get you brewing with as minimal investment as possible. My goal is to get you a quick win. I want you brewing something that you can be proud of and drink in a short period of time. And no, it's not going to be award winning. But is it going to be drinkable and something that you're happy to share with friends? I bet it will. So in this video, we're making beer and we're going to be doing some slightly unconventional brewing practices through the course of this video series. And one of them can be a little bit dangerous if you're not paying attention. So pay attention to your brews. That practice is that we are not going to be using an airlock for any of these brews. Instead, we're going to just use the lid that comes with our fermentation vessel and make sure that it stays on secured, but loose so gas can escape. And then after a period of time when fermentation has slowed down, we'll start to keep it tight, but burp it a few times every single day so that way pressure doesn't build up in the fermentation vessel. This is not a commonly recommended route and it's the reason airlocks exist. They're much safer. For that reason, we recommend buying a beginner brewing kit and we recommend the craft a brew series of beginner kits. Links to those will be in the description of this video. So that way you can pick one up. It comes with an airlock, which provides that level of safety. But if you're following this video to the letter, just remember to pay attention, release the pressure from your fermentation vessel regularly and avoid building up pressure that can lead to a catastrophic failure of your fermentation vessel. Another thing we're not going to talk about in this video is the hydrometer, which is arguably the most important piece of home brewing gear you can have. If you're just starting out, you might not want to spend 10 or 12 bucks on a hydrometer, but I guarantee you it is an invaluable tool and should be the first piece of home brewing gear that you purchase. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have a hydrometer. It tells you your starting gravity and your final gravity, which helps you understand what ABV your brew is. And it tells you a little bit about the progress of your brew as you're moving through the primary stage of fermentation. Now that said, I am going to talk about gravity readings and show you the alcohol by volume of the brews in this series. So don't worry, you'll have a rough estimate of the alcohol content of this brew. And lastly, in my spiel contextualizing this brew, sanitizing. I like to use a no rinse sanitizing solution called Starsan. It's great. You mix it up, you dunk all your stuff in it, you shake them off, you don't have to rinse it. It's sanitized so that way microbes from your environment are much less likely to get in your brew. However, you may not be interested in purchasing Starsan or another sanitizer just yet. Never fear. You can dunk all of your brewing gear in hot water, 160 degrees Fahrenheit or above for about three to five minutes and that should sanitize it. Just make sure that temperature stays above 160 degrees in that vessel. The easiest way to do this is to bring a giant pot of water to a boil, let it cool for about 10, 15 minutes, and then dunk all of your gear in there for a minute or two. Alternatively, and I think possibly an even easier option, is to put all of your gear that's gonna to touch your brew into the dishwasher on the sanitize cycle, using no soap, no rinse aid, just in there on the sanitize cycle. It's gonna blast all of your gear with high heat and steam, thus sanitizing it in the dishwasher, so it can go right from the dishwasher into your brew room and be used to brew. 
Sanitizing is one of the most important things you can do to ensure the success of your brews, so don't skip this step. Anything that's ever gonna touch your brew should be sanitized prior to use. All right, you ready? Let's get in here and make some beer. Let's start by taking a look at the gear we're gonna need to brew this beer. You're gonna need a two gallon stock pot, prep bowls, a carboy or water jug, a tea ball or reusable tea bag, a muslin grain bag, a rolling pin, a spoon, a plastic bag, a funnel, siphon and tubing, and bottles. You can use either crown cap or swing top bottles. If using crown cap bottles, you'll need crown caps and a capper. The ingredients for this recipe are one pound of dry malt extract, one ounce of crystal 40L malt, one ounce of crystal 120L malt, five grams of centennial hops, and about a gallon of water. So we'll start our process by putting a gallon of water into our brew pot. We're gonna raise the temperature in that pot up to 155 degrees. Meanwhile, we're gonna take those grains, both of our crystal malts, and place them in the plastic bag. These malts are unmilled, so we are going to mill them in this plastic bag by rolling them over with a rolling pin. Now some home brewing shops will mill your grain for you. If that's the case, go ahead and let them do it. It saves a little more time out of your day. When milling your grains with a rolling pin, you're trying to just crush them. You're not trying to obliterate them, pulverize them, turn them into a powder. You're just trying to expose a little bit more surface area. Here's how that will look. You'll see some of the grain husks in there as well as the crushed up grains, but they're still in relatively large pieces. We haven't turned them into some kind of flour. We'll place all of those grains inside of our straining bag. And then we'll just tie a knot in that bag and wait for our water to finish coming up to temperature. Meanwhile, we'll put all of our hops into the tea bag or tea ball, whichever you're using. So that way we have something to strain those. And it's important to remember that hops will expand to about three times their size when they soak up water. So make sure your bag or tea ball is about three times the size of the amount of hops that we're using here. Once our thermometer has read 155 degrees, we're gonna put our grains into the water and kind of move them around, make sure the bag's fully saturated. And then we're gonna let that steep for one hour off the heat. After an hour, we'll pull the grains out and strain the bag. And you can see just how much color and obviously flavor they've contributed to this brew. Now we're gonna raise the heat and get it ready to boil. While the heat's coming up to temperature, we're going to very slowly add in our dry malt extract. And you'll just wanna slowly pour and stir and break up the clumps to make sure it fully dissolves. You don't want any sinking to the bottom and burning on your burner. Once that's fully combined, we just have to wait for hot break. You're gonna see a lot of proteins come up to the top as it starts to boil, and eventually those proteins will break and separate. It's very important to watch your temperature during this part and make sure you ride that temperature control to make sure that it doesn't boil over because it can boil over and create a very sticky mess. So as it starts to grow and increase in size, you might have to dial your heat back or move it off of the burner in order to make sure that it doesn't boil over. Once you get to your hot break, your risk of boil over is almost nothing. And as you can see here, we have entered hot break, so it's time to put our hops in. We're gonna boil those hops for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, we'll scoop out our hops and those can be discarded. Just make sure you don't discard them anywhere a dog might find them because these can be very harmful to dogs and they're sweet, right? They've soaked up all of the sugar water. So a curious dog might be interested in eating them and we want to avoid that. Then we're gonna cover this and let it come down to room temperature. That can take a few hours to overnight. So once it's come down to room temperature, we're going to funnel it right back into the jug that our water came from. 
be very careful as you pour that in. And as you can see, there's a nice amount of headspace there, so we didn't boil off too much of our liquid. Our yeast is now going to go in, and we're using a very standard and easily accessible beer yeast for this. That goes right on top. Then we're going to tighten the lid, shake it all around to mix in the yeast, and then that lid is gonna go on and loosen. So that way it's on, but it's not tight. We want gas to be able to escape from the top of this bottle. We do not want this bottle to build up pressure. For the first week, your whole goal is to just make sure that the cap on that plastic bottle stays loose. Sometimes, as fermentation's happening, some of that sticky liquid on the inside can kind of gas up and gunk up the threads that hold that lid on. So you just want to check every day, a couple times a day, just to make sure that the lid is still loose and hasn't fallen off. Now, after a week, fermentation's going to start to slow down, and that is when you can start to tighten the lid. But still, three or four times a day, you're gonna to wanna to come in and make sure you burp out the gas. And do that for the entire second week. In your third week, you should see very little fermentation activity. It should basically be done. You'll still have some off-gassing though because there's plenty of CO2 still coming out of the beer. So continue daily to burp that lid and make sure that you don't build up too much pressure inside of that vessel. After a month, that should definitely be done fermenting and ready to move on to bottling. Now, here's my caveat about us not talking about hydrometers in this series, is you won't know that it's done unless you have a tool to measure that. So four weeks is really that amount of time that any ale at ambient room temperature should be able to finish fermentation, and you should be able to, after four weeks, move on to bottling. Our beer is done fermenting, and you can see all that yeast has dropped to the bottom. So it's time to get it into bottles. And for this, we're going to be using a sanitized siphon and tubing and a sanitized funnel. The funnel is because we're going to be adding some sugar. One teaspoon of table sugar is gonna go into each bottle of beer. The remaining yeast will consume the sugar, convert it into carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide will become suspended in the beer, thus making it carbonated. So don't skip this step or you're gonna have flat beer. Next, we'll pump two or three times on our auto siphon to get the flow going. You see the beer is elevated above the bottles. That's because we're using gravity to siphon. And we're using our hose clamp here to clamp it off when the beer reaches just past the neck of the bottle. We wanna leave just a couple fingers width of room at the top of each bottle. Since I'm using crown cap bottles here, I will be capping all of these bottles. If you're using swing top or flip top bottles, you can just close them up and then put them away in a dark corner for a few weeks. However, I've got to get mine capped, so I'm using this inexpensive bench capper that I found at a thrift store to cap my bottles with some fresh caps, and then I will put those away in a dark corner for about a month. And there you go, eight beautiful bottles of very easily made homebrewed beer. All right, it's been about six weeks, so plenty of time to carbonate this beer. Let's go ahead and open it up, see how it tastes. Got a nice little haze to it, beautiful amber gold kind of color, and a nice rich thick head of bubbles on top. It smells malty and dense. It, uh, it reminds me a little bit of a Blue Moon or a Shock Top. This ain't a light beer. This isn't a Bud Light or a Michelob Ultra. This is, this is a beer that's gonna taste like beer. It's crisp and fruity. It's got a nice malty backbone, but it's not beating you over the head with like a dense, thick maltiness. It's not a chewy beer. It's absolutely refreshing. It's got all the character and nuance that you want without kind of beating you over the head with it. And with minimal ingredients and very minimal process, 
and it was made in a plastic jug. So I consider this recipe very beginner friendly. I consider it a success and I hope that you can brew one as tasty as this as well. If you do brew this, please leave a comment and let me know how it went for you. And again, if you're an experienced brewer and you saw something in this video you'd like to comment on to help beginners, drop a comment also. Again, I will remind you that the easiest and best way to brew is to buy a beginner brewing kit and use gear that is made for home brewing. So check out those links in the description to our recommended craft to brew beginner kits. They will set you up on a roadmap to success for your home brewing adventure. Make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you don't miss upcoming content from this channel. We've got a whole series of these beginner friendly videos coming. And until next time, happy brewing and cheers. Moment brews and various artists, everything from me to rose. Big creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most.